All right. Well, by my clock, it looks like we're two past ten. So to keep everybody on schedule for the day, I'm going to go ahead and kick start the um, today's web forum. And I hope everybody's morning is off to a great start. I'm Lori Barrow, and I serve as the Information Transfer Specialist and Forest Service Liaison uh, for your South Atlantic LCC. And as unbelievable as this sounds to me, um, welcome to the last South Atlantic Third Thursday web forum of 2013. Um, I know most of you are familiar with the forum, but for those of you who may have never joined us before, um, as the name implies, on the third Thursday of each month at 10 a.m., your cooperative hosts a web forum. The idea behind Behind the forum is to provide another way for us to share information about what we're doing and how it's getting done, and to allow folks an opportunity to ask questions and provide input on the uh, conservation future of the South Atlantic region. Um, each forum has roughly the same agenda, consisting of a brief introduction, followed by um, about a 20 to 35 minute presentation on a South Atlantic LCC mission relevant topic. Following the presentation, there will be plenty of time to ask questions about the presentation, and the remaining time will um, consist of a few brief updates from your cooperative, followed by an open discussion where anyone can ask questions about what we're up to. Um, so before we get into the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping notes. I'm going to be um, placing everybody on mute during the presentation, so I ask that if you have any questions, that you either type them directly into the chat box, which I'll be monitoring, or hold them until after the presentation. Then, of course, during the discussion session, um, all you need to do is press star six to unmute yourself. Now, before I mute everyone, which I'm guessing most of you are already muted, does anybody have any um, immediate questions uh, that they'd like to throw out? Okay, let me just go ahead and mute everyone. The conference is now in silent mode. All right, super. Well, um, with that, let me just first say that on the line today we have our coordinator, Ken McDermott, along with Janet Jakir and Amy Keister. And presenting today we have the man uh, behind the magic, the, the curtain, um, our most venerable science coordinator, Rua Mordecai. So at this time I'm actually just going to hand the reins over to Rua um, to let you introduce um, the, the, today's discussion. So let me just exit out of this real quickly. And I'll let you take it away, Rua, as soon as it goes over. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for coming so close to the, the Christmas holidays. Um, so what I'm going to do today uh, is catch you up on a little bit about some of the results from the recent Blueprint workshops. Uh, I see some folks that were there and some folks that weren't, so it should be a good, uh, good mix there. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, from from the workshops and where we're going over the next few months. So let me go ahead and share this real quick. All right. So um, so that's pretty much my my plan. Uh, always start with the mission of of your cooperative. So this is the two to four year mission creating this shared blueprint for actions to sustain natural and cultural resources. Um, and so that's what we're talking about today. So um, I'm going to dive right into the workshops, uh, some, of the, some of the results and, and what we found. Uh, here's a quick summary of the folks that, that were able to make it. Um, so we had about 200 people uh, total make it across the four different workshops we had. Um, so you can see that uh, split up on the Raleigh and Savannah workshops on the top left. Uh, the top right shows you participation by organizations, um, so managed to get a pretty good balance across that sort of federal, state, nonprofit um, axis there. A uh, good amount of university folks managed to attract some local government folks um, and some uh, folks from private industry as well, uh, which is really excellent. And I've actually been doing some follow-up with some other local government folks that were interested but couldn't make it to the workshop. So uh, that's it for the participation. Uh, what we also did is for, for folks that were coming to the workshops, we gave them the option of working at a really big area called large landscapes. Uh, so this is sort of three states or more, or smaller ecoregions, sort of one to two states, um, and split up the South Atlantic into those little sections. And so for the purpose of the workshops, you see on the bottom, uh, about 40% wanted to work at the large landscapes and ended up working across the entire South Atlantic LCC in, in their working groups. And about 60% uh, 
wanted to work at smaller eco regions, so we ended up chunking them into smaller regions for people to work at. Also, had folks self-rate on their knowledge, uh, so basically, uh, uh, you know, your knowledge about the different the geography, the ecosystems, and also cultural resources. And so, here are some of the results. Uh, so, these are just means um, across all the participants. So, on the top left, this as far as states go, uh, we did relatively well um, on on folks' knowledge of self-rated knowledge of states. We were a little light on Alabama. We did have some folks um, that, that are either from Alabama or work in Alabama, um, but we are a little lighter on that compared to other, other areas. And if you look at the knowledge for e the different ecosystems of the South Atlantic, um, actually did pretty well um, across all of those. Weren't, weren't too bad on, on any of those particular sections. Now, we also asked about uh, cultural resources. Um, and so you see the results on the bottom there uh, related to significant cultural sites, um, significant cultural heritage. A lot of this was sort of traditional ecological knowledge, intangible cultural heritage things, and the cultural use of natural resources, uh, which is hunting and fishing. Um, so didn't do as well on some of the sort of historical components, um, but we did manage to get a number of folks from nonprofits and historic preservation offices and others and tried to spread them out across the different groups. So at least during one day for every group, there was somebody that could bring some of that historical perspective. Uh, did a lot better on the cultural use of natural resources, especially for the hunting and fishing side, um, which makes a lot of sense given the group. And a very simple, quick breakdown of the participants with 58 different organizations, um, number of federal agencies, state agencies, a um, little bit of tribal, um, a bunch of other interesting organizations. Uh, also managed to have a lot of steering committee members show up at, at um, at one of the locations, which was good, bringing a different perspective um, into the meeting. And we also had uh, three of the adjacent LCCs represented as well. Um, so folks, science coordinators, and um, also the coordinator for Peninsular Florida were at the meeting, walking around. We sort of talked as, as we went, and, and so they were observing how everything went, which was pretty nice. Um, and we also had some folks from the Southeast Climate Science Center there as well. So. Um, Good breakdown, good mix of folks. There are some pictures at the bottom um, of some of the activities. And basically what, what folks were doing uh, was selecting sub-watersheds, so Huck 12s, uh, to be part of the blueprint, uh, picking some conservation actions to happen in those sub-watersheds, and doing a simple prioritization of those sub-watersheds. And uh, during the workshops, they were supported by a, a small set um, of supporting data at these first ones. We, we did a bunch of testing and, and throwing too much at folks uh, ended up being particularly challenging. Um, so uh, we did a few sets there and we're going to do a lot more testing post-workshop. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is our integrated landscapes. This is one of the layers that folks used. Um, and so what this is is a combination of all of your cooperative's uh, landscape indicators that cut across all the terrestrial systems. So this combines um, big patches of connected natural habitat, uh, two different connectivity measures, structural and functional, and also biodiversity hotspots, both for terrestrial and aquatic species. Um, and so the darker the blue, the more sort of areas that are high and all of those things overlap. So that was one of the layers folks had. Uh, this is the coastal condition um, index. So this is what's done every five years by EPA. Combines water quality and benthic uh, quality, sediment quality, those kind of things. Um, so green is, is not too bad, yellow is marginal, and red is bad. So these are broken up by coastal shoreline units. So that's, this is the, the, uh, one of the indicators for the South Atlantic and the estuarine system. Uh, this is one of the cultural resource indicators looking at the amount of natural habitat around historic sites on the National Historic Register. Um, you can't see it from here, but they're broken down into two colors, ones that still have their, um, their context and those that, that have sort of lost it due to too much urbanization. Um, so for those of you that, that don't know, um, if there's too much development around some of these historic sites, uh, they can get kicked off because they lose their overall cultural context when you come to visit those sites. So that's one of the cultural resource indicators. 
And then a few of the threat layers, uh, um, you know, future urban growth, sea level rise, and uh, threats to flow alteration. Um, so this is combining connect aquatic connectivity and water withdrawals and sort of reservoir modifications, things like that. So those are just a few of the um, layers folks had, and I'll, like I said, I'll mention a little bit later um, about how we're going to follow up with other pieces of information. Here are the six conservation actions uh, folks had to work with. So this is part of the open standards for the practice of conservation, uh, their uh, conservation action taxonomy. So there's more details about um, all of these. Uh, but here are the broad types folks are working with. So you know, your land water protection, so this is easements and permanent protection, you know, land acquisitions in um, land and water. And you had land water management, so now we're talking about uh, prescribed fire and fish passage and specific management um, of those areas. Then there's livelihood, economic, and other incentives. So now we're talking about sort of payments for ecosystem services, cost sharing, um, promoting ecotourism, promoting more uh, natural resource friendly uh, economic practices. Um, so this is more on the incentive side. And then we had species management. So this is particular things like reintroducing species, um, translocations, things like that. Then education and awareness, uh, specifically to achieve a conservation outcome. Um, so not just generally educating people, but educating things to facilitate some kind of conservation action, like you know educating folks about stormwater practices and um, and things like that in urban communities, specifically to improve water quality and flow. And then the last one uh, was law and policy. Uh, so this includes things like you know helping urban communities in developing ordinances um, and you know helping with creative policy alternatives. Um, in certain areas. So those were the uh, six conservation actions that folks had to work with at the meeting. And uh, folks were working under two different constraints. Um, so we needed some way of, of sort of prioritizing and making sure that we didn't just cover the entire South Atlantic um, to make it somewhat realistic on what we could potentially do uh, collectively. And so the two constraints, this was the first one, the Tier 1 subwatersheds can't cover more than 30% of the group's ecoregion. So, um, so this is including you know, the, that collection of different actions. Uh, this threshold, it comes up in a number of different places, um, some sort of meta-analyses and synthesis of um, some work in conservation planning, uh, particularly in the marine side, um, as, a, as a threshold to, you know, what's enough to sustain some of the natural and cultural resources in these rapidly growing areas um, while still balancing sort of something that's realistic and, and, and helps people make decisions. I actually investigated some other thresholds that folks have used in some other plans, things like 50%, um, and you know, the, the sort of the feedback was that was just way too much. Um, they were just didn't really help us prioritize. So that was the first constraint. And the second constraint is that these Tier 1 subwatersheds with a conservation action land water protection. Um, so this is, you know, your permanent protection, your easements can't cover more than 10% of the area. And so this came from extrapolating the amount of conservation we've been able to do and money spent uh, per year in the South Atlantic region and then pushing that out to around 2050. Um, with, you know, it's a little, little extra squish in there. Um, but just trying to get to, okay, how much might we be able to do um, into, that, into that future with related to the most expensive of these actions. So those were the two constraints uh, that folks had to work under in the, the prioritization. So um, for these breakout groups, I mentioned people worked at landscape and they worked at these smaller ecological regions. And so for every area of the South Atlantic, there were six different groups um, that would evaluate it. There were four different landscapes groups in Raleigh and Savannah that looked at the entire LCC. And there were two different smaller ecoregion groups that covered the smaller areas. So um, a lot of different eyes and different groups looking at the same places from, from some different perspectives. Now, to make things a little more complicated as far as integrating the different workshop results, oops, um, 
most of the groups on the second day started from the previous group's work. Um, so uh, a lot of times folks were iterating on, on previous work, and so we you know, maintained the, the information from those previous workshops and folks built on it and prioritized from there. Um, so that's an, an added wrinkle in there. So right now we've been working on um, trying to find some different ways of merging all these workshop results together um, in a way that sort of honors the discussions that were happening. And so here is um, some draft from some stuff that we're actually just doing, uh, finishing off this morning. Um, and so you look, here's the South Atlantic area. And the darkest blue um, are places that were in Pier 1 at least once in both the landscapes and in a subregion. So from two different scales, these places um, were, were in Tier 1, and during later prioritization, no one ever moved them into a sort of a Tier 2, a we can't meet our thresholds. Um, and then that next level down of blue shows you places that were Tier 1 in both the landscapes and a subregion, but then they got moved to Tier 2 at least once. Um, so I'll give you an example of how that happened up in the very top right on the Outer Banks. Um, the Outer Banks came out, a lot of, you know, pretty much the entire Outer Banks came up as important, you know, and, and in Tier 1 at multiple scales. But when one of the groups radar looked at it and had that tough discussion about, okay, we need to prioritize what's the future of the Outer Banks going to look like, you know, with all the human encroachment and alteration and things that, and that interact with sea level rise. Um, and so as a group, they said, well, you know what, there's only a few places that we really want to hold the line on, and these other ones, you know, it's probably a good idea to start just saying, let's just going to become a highway and beach, and there's not much we can do about it. Um, so that's an example of a place that came up multiple times, but then was later moved into Tier 1 when people thought about future change and really had to prioritize heavily. Uh, that next level down in blue was Tier 1 in, in either a landscapes or a subregion, but not both. Um, so it's, it was only in one of the scales. And then the last color blue is, was Tier 2 um, and never really moved into Tier 1. Um, so we're experimenting with some different ways of, um, of looking at this and trying to get into those thresholds of that 30% um, for, the, for the whole area. Uh, so that's just sort of a, a preview um, of, of how some things are coming together. Something else I wanted to mention um, is that within each of these areas, so blow up this Albemarle Pamlico, I'm going to show you a little bit some of the results from one of the groups uh, out there. So now on the right, you have some of the results um, from one of the workshop groups. And you'll see, so these different colors are um, collections of HUC-12s um, all around the sort of same groups of conservation actions and same comments. So we can dive into one of them that I'm sort of pointing out here with this arrow. Um, so this is the Roanoke Bottomland System. And so the actions in the workshop were land water management, land water protection, um, and we have the reason for, okay, here's the reasoning behind this particular place and why it was important. Um, so that's, that's the kind of information that that's, was captured down at the workshop and that we have to, to build from. So um, next steps after these workshops. Um, we're having an open review of the workshop results on the Conservation Planning Atlas. And so a number of the groups at so South Atlantic LCC, databasin.org, um, and on the front under the recommended, there's draft results from the workshop. So we have the Raleigh workshops up now. So the folks that were at the Raleigh workshop had a little time to look over and start commenting on them. Um, and so now we're putting those up for the broader group. And then um, we'll announce it in the January newsletter. We'll have the Savannah workshop results up for people to explore. Um, so this is what it looks like um, up on the planning atlas. So you can actually zoom around, add layers, um, and it's connected to a Google Doc. So you can, you can you know, use a little eye, click on the information. It'll tell you the actions, and it'll give you a link to a document that shows, has the different comments about why people selected those things. Um, so, Raleigh workshops are up right now if you want to explore, and then Savannah workshops um, after the break in January, those will be up as well. And so next steps after that, um, we'll be testing the draft blueprints against indicator models and existing conservation plans. So um, there were some key uh, 
indicator models we weren't able to fit in that we want to um, further test and see, see how well that overlaps. Um, and also some existing conservation plans, um, particularly ones we weren't able to use in the workshop. So includes some you know, wildlife action plans, some, some key natural heritage layers, um, and you know, TNC eco-regional portfolios. So a few of these key plans um, and to try to identify some, some things that may have been missing from, you know, from the workshop or you know, to help inform some of the prioritization uh, as we get to a final draft. And then the blueprint teams are going to be um, making some of the decisions on integrating the workshop results and the post-workshop review and testing into a draft 1.0. So we're going to intersect what happened at the workshop with some of this um, testing of existing plans and some additional data to help integrate into a draft version 1 for you to view. And just a reminder of who's on those teams, um, so this conservation design team, these are the folks um, that have been helping a lot with the process and, and usually lead these types of conservation planning efforts. And also the user team. Um, so these are folks that are the potential early adopters, um, folks that are going to be, um, that we've already been discussing on, on some uh, issues of how we use it, how we, what form we want it to be in. Um, so this is that user team that's going to help shape that integration as well. Then um, from there, uh, moving to this version one, uh, we'll have a draft blueprint for you to look at by the end of January. So that's the timeline. We'll have something that integrates the first round of testing against existing plans and more indicator layers in the workshops all merged together into something you can uh, sink your teeth into and take a look at. So we'll have some activities for you to do for, for reviewing that. And in February, um, kicked off with the February newsletter, we're going to have some community input on blueprint uses. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that um, in a second, about that whole process. So you know, what are, what are the ways you want your cooperative to start focusing on um, helping and facilitating the use of the blueprint? Uh, so we'll hit that a little bit. And then the plan is to have the final blueprint version 1.0 approved by the steering committee at the end of March. So that's Blueprint 1.0 by March. That's our timeline. Then after that, um, going to be focusing a lot, as, as I queued up earlier, on you know, making it happen, helping facilitate implementation, helping, helping uh, get it used. Um, but also, in this sort of move up to 2.0, I'm going to be working on, uh, as part of the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, integrating with the surrounding cooperatives. So we've been having some discussions. They made it to the meetings. We track. We have regular monthly calls um, to, to try to think ahead of the game about how we're going to put all these different plans and designs together. And so the plan is to have, across the entire Southeast, um, all the LCC plans integrated by 2016. And the first step in that is going to be a joint South Atlantic Peninsula Florida blueprint by March of 2015. So one year after we approve Blueprint 1.0, we're going to have um, we're targeting to have a joint South Atlantic Peninsula Florida uh, blueprint. So that is the timeline for um, sort of the, the bigger post 1.0. So. I'm going to talk next about uh, sort of these next steps of um, how you want your cooperative to use the blueprint. Um, but before I dive into that, I just wanted to stop here and see if any, uh, see if you had any questions about what I talked about so far. So I'm just going to throw it open for for questions um, before we move on, and you can either let me see. You can either type them in the chat box, or you can uh, go ahead and just hit star six to unmute yourself and then ask them over the line. All right, sounds like we have yeah. no questions so far. Oh, perfect, hey, Mike. Hey, Roy, it's Mike. Um, yeah. I was wondering, the, the project we have with uh, um, NC State and NatureServe to test um, some of the rare species against the blueprint, what, what's the timeline for that? 
Oh yeah, so um, so Ashton is just now starting to test how well some of these indicator layers, um, so the indicators we picked um, are representing other components of the system. And so um, right now, I think she's got her first round of measures. So she's testing the that blue layer, the integrated landscapes, um, as a starting point against um, the first layer, beach mice, Raffineski's big-eared bat. Um, these were some of the tier two measures. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other two. So she's actually starting to test those right now. So we will have some of the results from that to be able to fold into this blueprint process. Just sort of look and say, okay, what might be slipping through the cracks given the data sets we have right now? Um, so that, but that overall, the entire testing process um, that they're doing is a year. Um, and it started, I think, about a month ago. Um, so that's got a year to go through, but we should have some results coming out of that. Um, I know she's actually, she tends to work over the holidays, so she's cranking out models right now. Um, so we should have some of that to fold into this um, sort of testing and discussion. Um, and will, will that include not just the indicators, but what, what about against the blueprint itself? It, well, I'm a little bit confused about how the data are actually informing the, the blueprint. The, it seems like that was more an expert opinion process to select those watersheds, and I'm sure there's a lot of you know, valuable on-the-ground knowledge that went into that, but I'm not following how we connect that to the data we have to actually kind of then support um, the, the areas that were selected through the, the workshop process. Yeah, so and that's, that makes sense. So. Yeah, and that's so that's what um, so Brad Pickens, our new um, postdoc, who actually started two days ago. Um, so he's going to be working on on some of those that testing piece. So for example, um, if you remember that, um, I'm just thinking from some of the the additional science perspective that we didn't bring in that Parka project, um, looking at sort of key amphibian and reptile conservation areas. Um, and some of that modeling, um, so that those models are ready and we're able to sort of test them. So we can take a basically a, you've got the workshops, which is a lot of expert opinion with a little bit of new sort of science and modeling, and then we're going to take the entire, the more model-based data-driven approach um, right now and then intersect them and see, and then identify some places that overlap and don't overlap. And then so, for those will be the chances to sort you know. of see collectively, okay, the data are telling us that this was missing from the workshop results. Um, you know, is that something that really needs to be in the, in the blueprint or is there some other reason why the data might be leading us astray? And then vice versa, this came out of the blueprint, but you know what? It doesn't seem to be showing up in any of these data sets. Was this just a sort of somebody's pet area that may not be globally yeah. important? So both, um, both of those will be done before the March meeting um, when the steering committee will be uh, presented the, yep. the 1.0 version? Yeah, and, and there'll be, um, so the first cut is going to be pre this draft in January. But even after the January draft, we're going to keep cranking on it. Um, so we'll keep doing more testing and more data-driven stuff even after this draft is released in January. Um, and then given some of the time where um, Brad's also going to experiment with doing some um, a, sort of a data-driven integration too, um, if we have some time, like looking at sort of MarkSan and, and doing some optimization on the landscape to see, okay, if we, if we just, if we didn't even have these workshops, what might the blueprint look like? Uh, purely data-driven. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Yep, yep. Any other uh, questions? Hey, Rua, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear Hi, you. this is Sarah McRae in Raleigh. Hey, Sarah. Um, I have a question about the um, sort of that preliminary draft workshop result map that you had up there, and I'm just trying to look at the colors and decipher it looks to me like the dark blue, and I just am trying to understand what you had presented. So the darkest blue are things that currently are going to fit into that top 30% category. Is that correct? So the dark blue um, were the ones that I think the darkest blue covers 20% of the landscape okay. um, when we actually did the calculation. So we've got at least 10% more to work with beyond that dark blue if we made the decision that those were sort of the no-brainer sites just from the workshop itself. Okay, um, I just, um, it just, 
when I look at that, it's striking to me that, like, um, some of the very highly significant areas um, in our work area for the Raleigh field office, like the upper tar watershed, none of them are dark blue. And so that's just something that when I looked at that, I was like, whoa. I, I'm not quite sure how to interpret that. So I just wanted to make sure that I understand exactly Tier 1 and Tier 2 and what this means in terms of the overall blueprint so I can provide comments accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why we're playing with some of the different ways of putting it together. So, you know, in general, that means that the upper tar um, didn't come out in both a landscape and a, a smaller ecoregion and then stay in Tier 1 um, through the thing. Now, that doesn't mean that in this first draft, it's not going to be in there. More of we're experimenting with different ways of putting it together. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's why it's not in there right now. Um, but that's exactly the kind of questions, sort of. That's why we're trying to put some of this stuff out earlier and thinking about, you know, okay, well, what might slip through the cracks? What do we really need to test? And um, we'll see how everything comes together. So, but that would be why it's not. Um, in the darkest, darkest blue. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? Hey, Rua, this is Rua, This is Ken. I, I just wanted yeah. to make, if I make sure I'm saying the right thing here, straighten me out if I'm not. That I mean, that's what the review is about: is to do mm -hmm. to make the comments that exactly that Sarah is making yep. there. If there's something that doesn't seem right, that's what we need to know. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's why we're getting some eyeballs on there so we can sort of explore and be like, okay, are we missing something? What's, what's the, you know, what's the, um, yeah. So that's the point of having some eyeballs on here. Um, and then, and then Rua, I wanted to make one other comment about Mike, like I thought I was off mute and I wasn't about Mike's question. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to make sure that we um, clarify as we go, go to version 1, 1.0 1 here, how well, you know, part of the whole thing is moving, that we're moving fast and we're trying to model these indicators um, at the same time as we're moving forward, and it's, some of them are proving to be difficult for one reason or another. So we may not have the full portfolio modeled, I think, is, is the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we also would like to test how well does the blueprint support keeping those uh, indicators in, in the condition that we want them in. So that's another part of the testing. And I'm not sure yet whether we'll be able, how well we'll be able to get to there, but that's part of, I think, Mike, you know, sort of the data-driven piece that um, we've always been talking about the blueprint being able to do. So mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal. We'll do the best we can with all those pieces as we move forward, and it, it, we'll see how much of that we are able to pull together by, by March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good description. Other, other questions before I move on a little bit to the blueprint uses? All right, excellent, excellent. Very good, very good questions. Okay, so um, so a number of you are familiar with the different use cases um, that we sort of talk about a lot for, for the blueprint. Um, and what I'm going to go ahead and do now is uh, give you some examples of some of the more specific ideas that have been coming out of sort of from the steering committee, from the user team, and from some places um, within these different use cases. Um, so the first one, um, we've actually, I've modified the wording on this a little bit to I think this, this one there was a little confusion on, and, and this, this one I've tweaked just a tiny bit to better fit the kind of um, interest that people have had in it, um, which is finding the best places to use current resources. We used to just say best places to work together, but I think this really fits a little bit better. So, you know, where we've got some existing resources, people, funds, etc. cetera, um, where are the best places to use those resources? And so here are some of the ideas that have been coming out um, so far. Um, so integrating the blueprint into funding decisions for some of the existing funding programs, NACA, QIP, um, Clean Water Act, those kind of things. Um, integrating the blueprint into existing plans, uh, wildlife action plans, essential fish, fish habitat, climate adaptation, national forest plans. Um, using the blueprint to find the next best places for partnerships. So, you know, where are the next best places we need to start facilitating new partnerships? Um, and also using it to coordinate monitoring efforts. Uh, so those are some of the, the ideas that have been coming out so far. 
um, the second use case, the second of the six use cases we talk about is bringing in new conservation dollars. Um, so kind of bringing in some new funds we don't already, haven't already been getting in this South Atlantic area. And here are some examples um, of specific uses that have come out, um, using the blueprint to work with some national nonprofits and foundations to bring in some new funds like uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Trust for Public Lands, um, using the blueprint to work with some national federal programs to bring new resources to the region, uh, like Land and Water Conservation Fund and some of these others um, that may not already be coming to the South Atlantic. Um, and also helping make proposals from the South Atlantic that obviously align with the blueprint more competitive in national funding competitions. So those are a few of the cases in that. Um, another key one is, is thinking about uh, how our gray infrastructure grows and helping guide infrastructure development and decisions by, um, you know, for energy, transportation, and our growing urban communities. And uh, a lot of a lot of different interesting ideas coming out of this one, um, you know, using the blueprint to help support land acquisition decisions by some of the county open space programs and land trusts, um, looking at creative policy options in blueprint areas, especially water quality to achieve the blueprint actions, um, informing local green infrastructure projects, especially those on focused on climate adaptation, um, using the blueprint to help improve local ordinances and using the blueprint to inform mitigation decisions, uh, including new support for proactive uh, mitigation steps. Um, so these are a few things in that category that are, that are coming out. This, the fourth case is about incentives and alternative to regulation. Is there some way by us working together we can come up with some, some creative ways to avoid regulation? Um, and so here are a few that, that fit broadly into that category, um, using the blueprint to find alternatives to endangered species listings, um, using the blueprint to develop some new approaches for conservation incentives, um, some new incentive strategies, um, working with private landowners to develop sustainable timber certifications, um, and also um, using the blueprint to develop regional water plans, so get ahead of some of our, our water issues and, and see if we can head off some regulation. Uh, the fifth is this bringing a landscape perspective for local adaptation efforts. Um, so how, to, how to, all the work that we're all sort of doing, um, thinking about climate adaptation at more local scales, how does it fit into something bigger? Because a lot of climate adaptation is really about movements and corridors and, you know, it's really landscape scale. How do our, op, how do our actions add up? Um, and so here are a couple of the, the ideas that have come out. Um, help make the climate adaptation proposals from the South Atlantic uh, more competitive in national funding competitions. Um, and also integrating the blueprint into some of these organizational climate adaptation plans. And the last one relates to responding to major disasters. You know, can we get ahead of the game, um, either in building resilience in the system ahead of time or, you know, post-disaster in, in some of the recovery as a conservation community. Um, and there are two things that have uh, come up so far in that. Um, having some green infrastructure slash conservation restoration projects ready when the next funding opportunity hits, when the next Sandy Gulf of Oil, Mexico oil spill, you know, when the next thing happens as a cooperative, have some powerful projects ready to go up and, and, um, and ready. And then also incorporating the blueprint itself into some of these disaster response plans. Um, so this is more of instead of having a specific project, have the, the sort of areas and some of the actions um, integrated into the disaster response plans. So those are just a, a few examples um, of some of the ideas that are, that are coming out. Um, like I said, in February, um, and, and we're going to launch it with the February newsletter, um, we're going to do a more, you know, sort of a community-wide way to get some input on some of these different actions, both prioritizing some of the ideas that are out right now, um, but also suggesting some things that might be missed. Um, so those are just a, um, a few of the ideas that have come up, and this is all leading up to the steering committee um, eventually having a discussion in March and deciding um, what and how we want to focus our efforts on blueprint implementation uh, into the next year. So uh, any questions about that? And then a reminder, star six to unmute yourself. All right, excellent. Well, if you've, 
you forget about something or have something else you want to know, you can always add it later. Um, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you, Lori. All right. Thanks, Rhea. All right. There we go. Well, thanks again, Rhea, for that for that great presentation. I know from my end, it's always beneficial to go over the next steps and think about how the blueprint will evolve and, and might be used throughout the region. Um, your staff here at the LCC is constantly thinking about how we can, you know, uh, reach out and get your input um, and integrate it into this blueprint. So um, Rhea does a great job of, you know, constantly providing opportunities for feedback and updates. So um, we have some time now for uh, a few questions, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> for some updates. Um, and uh, some of you may have heard about the recently announced LCC National Council. Um, and as a representative, actually the new representative for the LCC network, our very own Ken McDermott had a few updates he wanted to share with you all today uh, regarding the National Council. So again, Ken, star six and you'll be able to give an update on uh, the council. Testing, testing. <laughs> Roger. All right. Uh, this, again, this is Ken McDermott, and I want to zoom way out from the South Atlantic LCC, and I think everybody knows that there's a, a broader network uh, across uh, North America into Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands of 22 LCCs. And over the past couple of years, there's been this idea about forming a, uh, a support uh, group, and that has actually finally come to fruition. And there's been a, uh, a charter developed and members um, recruited to fill various seats within this LCC National Council. And before I forget it, uh, to get uh, any more details about that, you can go to the LCC Network site, which is lccnetwork.org. Um, and what I just want to say is that the, generally the purpose of this council and it will be yet to be seen how it plays out, is to, is to be a support, um, uh, a group of supporters for the network and landscape conservation, but specifically for the LCCs and the network. Um, so just to give you an idea of the kind of uh, influence that's, that's coming together on this council is that you've got, uh, let me see, it's five, six regional, uh, six federal agencies uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, NOAA, Forest Service, and Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and most of it is like the directors of those agencies are going to settle in the council. We have four state uh, participants. Two of them have yet to be filled, but those come from the, uh, the four regional uh, state fish and wildlife uh, groups. So, and in our particular area, we're lucky to have Mallory Martin um, on from the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies on the council. Uh, then there's also uh, federally recognized tribal participants. We have non-governmental organizations like um, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Land, and NatureServe. And then we have some international participants like from British Columbia, uh, Yukon, Micronesia, and one other seat to be filled there. And then we also have an indigenous participant. Um, and, and then uh, also from some major partnerships like the Association of Joint, Van Man uh, Joint Venture Management Boards and the National Fish Habitat Board, there are participants. And I got the lucky uh, nod or vote or whatever to actually be the only um, participant who's actually, whose specific role is to represent the LCC network, which includes all 22 LCCs, their steering committees, and everybody who's involved. So I just want to let you know that, uh, that that first meeting of that council is coming up the first week of February, and I think a lot of that will be this group coming together to sort of to, to hopefully um, be energized and, and figure out how the best they can support the network. And we will be bringing some specific issues to them, um, very general ones at this point. But I just wanted to let you know that this was going on and that you can get information through um, the, the LCC network site. And if you have anything um, on your mind that you think you'd like um, this council to be thinking about in terms of supporting the LCC network, please feel free to uh, connect with me, or obviously Mallory is a, a good person too that would be probably like to hear from folks as well. So um, with that, that's all I have, and present, unless there's any questions. Just to remind folks to star six if you had any questions for Ken.
Okay, great. Um, and if you want to find out more about that, you can always go to the lccnetwork.org site itself. Or um, Marshall Williams, our steering committee chair here at the South Atlantic LCC, actually did a great blog post um, on the southatlanticlcc.org site itself. So you can um, take a, a peek at it there to learn more about the, the National Council. Just a few um, more updates. So the next uh, South Atlantic Web Forum will take place um, January 16th, uh, same time, uh, 10 a.m. And uh, continuing on with our, our progress towards the development of the draft uh, blueprint, we'll be providing another overview um, uh, on where we're at uh, in the development of that. And. Just to remind folks, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved through uh, the, the web community. The South Atlantic operates a really active web page with groups representing uh, multiple interests. Um, we host multiple web forums and brown bags and, and have numerous opportunities to you know, uh, allow you to participate. And we really value and want your thoughts, ideas, and concerns. So feel free to engage with steering committee members or contact a, a a staff member directly. Um, and with that, um, we have some time open for any questions or comments that you might have. And for folks who are traveling, I just want to wish everybody a really happy holiday. Um, and again, just star six to unmute yourself. So any questions about even not just the presentation or Ken's update, but about your cooperative in general? Totally fair game. Rua, good morning. This is Gina Olme. Hey, Gina. I was just curious to get your kind of 30,000-foot uh, perspective on um, on the workshops themselves and, and what you got out of it, and maybe how that compares with other um, efforts that have been done to identify you know, priority habitat areas in the region. Yeah, and actually that's a um, – and I, could, I can start, but there's at least a few people um, that were at the workshop themselves that might want to chime in um, as well. I think, um, you know, the scale was different. Um, I think that the things that I've heard, I'm thinking from discussions I've heard um, from people at the workshop at that sort of 30,000 feet, um, you know, the diversity and scale was a little bit different, you know. So that diverse of a group of people across such a big area instead of a smaller area to be able to take that larger landscape, um, especially that having people look at the big scale and the small scale, the big landscapes and the smaller landscapes seemed to be something that was different than what folks had done before. Um, and I think also this, the getting into the conservation actions part, you know, so not just picking places to focus or focus areas. Um, but actually picking types of actions and things to happen in places um, I think is, is fundamentally different than almost every plan we have um, out there right now. Um, and that, that actually that came from our design team, from sort of TNC did a big look back on their conservation design efforts over the years and their biggest you know, international look. And, um, and in that document, one of the big things they say that they – they want they should do in the future and, and could have done better is is exactly that actually identifying not just focus here but what are the actions we need to take in this place um, so I think that was a, a, a big difference in a lot of what's already happened um, and I think also a little more interesting interactions between folks that are working uh, near urban areas and far from urban areas um, I think that sort of like how do we put those resources together was another another uh, difference between them. So that's just a few quick thoughts off the top of my head. Um, any other thoughts from folks that were at the workshop? This is Ken. I, I'll, I'll just say I think and Mike Mike expressed this, and I've heard it both at the workshops and um, from people as sort of the. Uh, interest in seeing the, the, the kind of the data-driven side of this, and um, you know, it was purposeful that we didn't overload those workshops with that because it's it's a, just a difficult thing to try to get everybody's mind around all that we were asking of them. So uh, I think that that was something that came out as people wanting to see, and so we have some work to do to follow up to make sure that gets brought into the process, and that is the intent. It was just a challenging thing to try to do too much at one time in one place with people that were zooming in for just a few hours. 
Does that, does that get at what you were um, thinking about in general, Gina? I think the other thing that um, that came up before I forget about the workshops that was a little different was the, the that sort of approach of doing it relatively quickly with a whole lot of people. Um, so having sort of these compressed one-day workshops um, I think was a little bit different than what had been done in the past that helped get a lot more people around the table. Usually, at least from the ones that I know about, usually the plans um, that I'm sort of thinking about that have been usually have a sort of a smaller working group of, you know, maybe like 10 to 20 people that are really sort of getting their hands dirty with the places. Um, so I think that was also another difference is having so many people look at those. Is that, is that what, kind of the, the question you were asking, Gina? Yeah, a little bit. I, I was I, I was really actually leaning more towards, um, obviously it wasn't very clear, um, were there really any, because um, I attended one of the workshops and I thought it went really well. I thought um, it was well organized and, and you know, really good participation from people that were there. Were there any real surprises in, in the results that have come out, um, things that you didn't expect to see? I would say, at least from what I've seen so far, um, I think the two, two things that I was surprised on, um, one was how well, when you sort of put all the efforts together, um, that it actually sort of looked like a logical network, a sort of a logical sort of connected system. Um, I was a little concerned at the beginning that it might be sort of too fragmented on people sort of picking places, and then when you put everything together, it wouldn't logically make sense as a whole. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it does that near the coastal plain and things get complicated in the urban areas, um, which is kind of interesting too as far as people sort of make the best connections you can given the, the urban areas. Um, so I was actually surprised at how well the, so far it, it looked relatively connected. Um, I think also what, what I was, um, another su surprising thing, um, I think to me a little bit was some of the discussions that happened in some of the really uh, sort of impaired, like the Outer Banks is sort of, and I think I gave that example earlier, um, was kind of interesting. Um, I had expected, you know, given some of the early results that um, given how much sort of interest and value there is around the place like the Outer Banks, I didn't really expect a group to make some of those harder decisions about, you know, like, okay, we're just going to let this go, <laughs> you know, I mean, sort of like, and maybe do some land swaps. I think the land swaps one was kind of an interesting one I hadn't expected of, you know, people talking about, hey, we have conservation land here, like, we really do think we can abandon it and get something better in the interior, um, which was a kind of an interesting, um, which is interesting as well. Well, and one um, of the valuable parts that came out of that was the, the managers that are out there that are working on some of those areas appreciated the, the consistent science piece that was being brought to the table that sort of confirmed and supported what they were what they were anticipating and helped them make their point about um, about what they thought was important. So it was kind of a two way two way uh, dialogue there, I think, or benefit. Yeah. Oh, and I had one other surprise, which was. Um, at least, in, and this is more just sort of in the groups that I was sort of hearing and discussions I was hearing, um, I was, because this, you know, included both the natural and the cultural side, you know, the sort of historic um, components as well, I, I was surprised to the level that a lot of folks were willing slash able, what have you, to take off their pure conservation organization hat and think about some of the historic resources as well. You know, people spending some of their sort of time and prioritization on thinking more holistically as sort of a, a, a member of a place, you know, beyond just the mission of their organization. Um, and I heard a lot of folks that, you know, were pretty much work for pure conservation organizations really trying to think about um, and actively involve the historic part of the landscape, um, which I thought was, which was, um, you know, I thought it might happen with one or two people, but the level at which it happened in some of the groups, um, it didn't happen with everyone, but the level at which it happened was um, surprised me as well. 
Well, great. Um, if, if, if there's any more questions, we're happy to hang around, but it looks like we're getting close to our time, and I don't want to keep folks longer, but uh, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to chime on in. All right. Well, you can always uh, contact us directly or shoot one of us an email if after this presentation you, you, know, you have some follow-up questions. And again, I want to wish everybody a happy holiday, and thanks for participating in today's web forum. Uh, we'll see you all in the new year. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks, everybody.